You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, my name is Lars Hansen. I'm uh, the uh, director of the Becker Friedman Institute at, at the University of Chicago. On behalf of my uh, co chair, Kevin Murphy, we're happy to welcome you to this event. Um, our mission is to advance economic research and to bring research and economic analysis to public discussions of significant policy issues and economic challenges, and that's certainly what brings us here tonight. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank our speaker, Charlie Evans, um, and everyone here at the Fed who's kind of helped make this whole event possible. Um, we're also grateful for two alumni who've uh, funded this event, uh, Don Wilson and uh, Eddie Allen. Um, and I'm especially pleased to be here at the Fed, which has been a partner in participating with the Institute's work for, for several years now in various ways. Uh, a good example is the following. The Institute works with undergraduate econ majors to uh, put on events for students. And in 2012, we were fortunate enough that Charlie, together with two of his fellow Fed presidents, Niriana Kachlakota and Charlie Plasser, participated in a panel discussion uh, for, for our undergraduates on the Fed aims and the conduct of monetary policy. And this is through an audience of 200 of our students, of our energetic students now. Um, the panelists offered their views of, uh, on monetary policy. They were not all in agreement. Um, and and, the, and there's some discussions about things like the short-term uh, nominal interest rates when they're close to the uh, zero lower bound. It turns out the conversation they gave, they provided, was just in advance of an important policy initiative uh, featuring forward guidance that we'll talk about a little bit about later. This was meant to provide a clear, target-based plan for a policy to guide people's expectations about future Fed moves. About one week later, the Fed Open Market uh, Committee announced the, uh, that the Fed rate, funds rate would indeed remain near zero until unemployment and inflation pass target thresholds. So our undergraduates kind of got an advanced version of the announcement. Um, I view tonight's the discussion as kind of a sequel to that student event, and, uh, and, that, and I'm really pleased that Charlie and I can uh, uh, talk on such subjects. We can't promise that tonight you will, uh, that, that what we talk about tonight will be policy next week. Well, maybe Charlie can, but I, but I suspect not. Uh, but, but, but we do aim to give you a bit of a glimpse in terms of the factors and analysis that go into policy that affects us on an everyday basis. So let me tell you a little bit about our expert this evening. Uh, so Charlie is the ninth president and chief executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Um, in that capacity, he serves on the Federal Open Market Committee. He's, uh, this is the kind of the Federal Reserve System's monetary policymaking body. He's, uh, as, as, as head of the Fed since 2007, Charlie oversees a work of a roughly 1,400 employees who conduct economic research, supervise financial institutions, and they provide payment services to commercial banks and the U.S. government. He previously served as, uh, as, as director of research and senior vice president, supervising the bank's research on monetary policy, banking, financial markets, and uh, regional economic conditions. He received his bachelor's degree at, uh, um, from the University of Virginia. He got his doctorate at Carnegie Mellon, unfortunately, after I'd left, but well, unfortunately for me, not him, but uh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Charlie for many years, and he's made a variety of important contributions to uh, research prior to his important role in the conduct of monetary policy. A couple of these stand out, and these kind of have been very durable contributions to this day. And unfortunately, his two co-authors get more credit for this than he does, although it's clear he's the one who did the bulk of the work. One explores the impact of the monetary policy shocks or impulses from an empirical perspective. And, and, and it's a, a wonderful kind of summary of, uh, a, a, of a whole bunch of evidence that, that, that has guided a bunch of future conversations. Another developed a version of a new Keynesian model with nominal rigidity, so it was rich enough to con confront time series evidence. And this paper has kind of set a template for a lot of the models that are used in various different uh, um, uh, central banks around the world. And it's been tremendously influential. So anyway, let, let's get started. Um, my plan is to ask Charlie a range of questions. And then at the end, we'll open it up so that you can ask them as well. Uh, please note that we're broadcasting the conversation live on Bloomberg Media, so, so, so we're videotaping the session to be posted on the Institute's website. 
Uh, when I get to the question, period, uh, question portion of this, please use the provided microphone so your questions can be audible to uh, all in the audience. So with that, I'm going to step down from here and, um, and engage Charlie. Great. Can I just uh, uh, welcome everybody sure. um, here to our home? Uh, it's great to see such a large crowd. I'm glad everybody could fit in. And uh, Lars mentioned that I went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, and, uh, which I did, and I arrived in 1983. And in the January of 1984, I took my first graduate econometrics class where everybody said, well, the person who taught this class before was Lars Hansen. He invented the material that we are going to teach you, generalized method of moments. And there was no textbook available. And you just had to listen very carefully and, and try to understand it. Um, that served me extraordinarily well. And it's a really great privilege to uh, uh, be, on, be here with you. Thanks, Lars. Thank you. So let's get started. Um, ben Bernanke recently described most FMOC meetings in the following way. And I quote, they get lots of attention. Most of them are deadly boring. They are very scripted. The staff do all the work. They write the communique in advance uh, of the decision making. So from an outsider's perspective, I found this to be rather surprising. I, was not, I, I would have expected highly energetic conversations and not deadly dull uh, meetings. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you agree with, this, uh, uh, with uh, Ben's perspective on, this, on these meetings? Yeah, I saw that quote. I was surprised by that um, You know, when he, he said that they're they're boring, but if you think about it uh, a little bit, there probably are some reasons why you might think that. One, he's the chair, and he would like for things to be about as boring as possible because he'd like to get to a particular outcome, right? <laughs> um, I think that when uh, we did have spirited debate, that was always uh, very interesting and often productive, and we you know, often had to uh, postpone ultimate decisions because that led to other discussions. It's very important for us to prepare, prepare as much as possible. Uh, especially during these uh, unusual times. I've been the president since 2007. You can, you can date when things started going downhill when I became president on September 1st, <laughs> 2007. My first meeting was to vote in favor of cutting the funds rate by 50 basis points. I've never been able uh, to vote for an increase. It's, it's just been like that. And when when you are considering these extraordinary unconventional monetary policies, we just have to talk about them quite a lot. We had one meeting when we were planning the first uh, so-called quantitative uh, easing, uh, the first version of it. I believe there were 24 memos uh, distributed for that particular meeting that we all read, absorbed, talked about with our staff. and. Uh, they covered all the elements of the special liquidity programs and things like that. So uh, we do plan a lot. And if it's really dramatic, that usually means that the next meeting is going to get more attention. I see. Good. So on September 2014, re this, re this past September, you made a statement that I found to a person like me to be somewhat refreshing, but, it's a, but not very common in, in, in kind of policy arenas. And, you say, and I quote again, um, I see two important divergent ways my forecasts can go wrong could go wrong. So at first, there's an acknowledgment of mistakes in forecasting, which is good. It's not good that you make the mistake. It's good that you acknowledge that's a possibility. Let me be clear about that. <laughs> but anyway, so let me go on with the quote. One is that I may be overestimating the underlying strength in the real economy. Guarding against this risk calls for more patient removal of accommodation. The second is that I may be wrong about the inflation outlook, and we may be poised for a much stronger rise in inflation than I'm forecasting. This risk calls for more aggressive rate hikes. So, th so to me, this suggests an uncertainty about the underlying model of the economy. This is certainly a perspective to which I'm very sympathetic towards. It suggests a systematic look of how alternative models, uh, look at alternative models when thinking about how to formulate a sensible policy. So I guess my question is, how much does uncertainty of this nature, kind of across models not knowing what the, right, you know, what the best model is, influence your own decision making? Right, so that's like a five course question. Um, <laughs> and I'll start off with You're looking the, for more courses? I'm, I'm gonna start off I'm gonna start off with the soup and sandwich <laughs> version of this and then it's only gonna deal with part and not the most interesting part that you're you're interested in. So you mentioned um, it's uh, it's good that you talk about making mistakes. And I, I agree with that, and I'll I'll put it this way. 
Uh, back at the time when I did the panel that you alluded to in December 2012, I had spent a year uh, going out and talking in public about how I thought that we would be very well served if we could firm up the public and financial markets expectations that we were going to keep the funds rate at zero for a very extended period of time. It would depend on economic developments. Nobody was very um, enamored with how we would go about describing those economic developments, and so I laid out uh, some ideas. And, you know, one, and we all talked about this, but I, I talked about it quite a lot. And the idea was when the unemployment rate was uh, 8%, um, I said, you know, we ought to uh, tell people we're going to keep the funds rate at zero at least, at least until the unemployment rate improves to 6.5%, which frankly is too high. I would say that's higher than the natural sustainable rate of unemployment, but I can't say I know that for sure. So that's one um, hurdle that we ought to you know, do that. But then I would very quickly say, but you know, I could be wrong about this. I think that we could continue to push until we get unemployment rate down that low. But I could be wrong. We could get higher inflation, and we ought to guard against that possibility. So we ought to also add, unless inflation uh, is expected one or two years ahead to be above some threshold which is uh, not very desirable. We had indicated our target was 2%, so I was quite agreeable to, well, I said 3%, you know, at least, you know, if it were 3%, then we should definitely stop and think maybe we're making a big mistake or something. Now, we ended up uh, actually started with 7% unemployment. The committee usefully knocked that down to 65 and we knocked the inflation down to 25 that provided conditionality that people could um, look at, hopefully understand, although there were questions uh, about that. So I think it's important to acknowledge that you might not have the right model. There are different ways that this could proceed. In the current environment, um, I've also talked about how I think it's useful to um, you know, tell everybody, but I think we should be patient about maintaining the stance of our current monetary policy. I don't think we should be in a hurry to increase interest rates. And when I think about what can go wrong now, I still come back to two possibilities. One, I don't think inflation pressures are um, evident at all. I don't think we're running 1.5% core inflation, and we've been doing that for a long time. So I don't think we're likely to get inflation to 2 or above that. But, you know, there's a risk. I could be wrong about that, so we should think about that. The other one is um, inflation could stay low for too long, and we could end up looking more like uh, we're facing European-type disinflation pressures, or even worse, Japan. If you think about those two really bad outcomes, I kind of think about it this way. If inflation were to pick up, we'd need tighter policy. You know what? We know how to do that. We have a long track record of increasing interest rates. Yes, we have a high, uh, very large balance sheet. It would be more challenging, but we have looked at more than 24 memos to study the tools that we put in place. And I'm confident, don't know for sure, but I'm confident that we can tighten financial conditions. So I think we could deal with higher inflation if that were to happen. But on the other side, the risk is very different and I think more deadly because if we found ourselves with inflation stuck at one and a half or going lower, we've already got the funds rate at zero percent. We've already spent a lot of effort trying to provide accommodation, and that would be an environment where we needed more accommodation. We've said we're trying to target 2%. We ought to get to 2%. Before I leave, uh, we ought to get to 2%. So uh, we'd have to think about the tools, and it's not obvious that the tools would be that easy uh, to do that. So you kind of weigh that, and I think that the, the costs are so much worse on this uh, low inflation side that we ought to be willing to make sure that we get inflation. Up. So that, that's how part of how uncertainty gets into it. Now you, you were alluding to other things as well in terms of statistical uncertainty. I, I would, I would we can come back to some of those. Okay, please. that's fine. You know, there's another statement I want to come back to. You said this is reference to unemployment, and we knocked it down. So I want to put that on hold for a moment, but I want, but but I do want to return to that one as well. Okay. <laughs> um, so related to uncertainty, recent news about the uh, macroeconomy has been very positive. How confident are you the recovery is going to will will continue to be strong, or are you concerned that this is kind of a temporary positive blip? So I am uh, pretty optimistic about the current state of the economic uh, recovery uh, growth, and I think that uh, we could well be you know past the worst of what we've uh, been facing. We've seen some seen a couple of quarters of really strong growth. Last quarter we got was five percent. 
there, there was a first quarter negative growth rate that we kind of forget about because nobody can quite understand it. It was bad weather like this and whatnot. But given what the fourth quarter growth rate looks like, a lot of people are thinking 3%. We could end up the year with 2.6% uh, real GDP growth for this year. That's pretty good. Um, that's better than we think the sustainable rate of uh, growth is over a long time period. Uh, technology and uh, labor inputs and things like that. It's probably more likely that two to two and a quarter is uh, sort of the uh, trend real GDP growth rate at the moment. So, so we're looking for things to be pretty good. Employment has been growing quite strongly for ever, ever since we uh, started the open-ended asset purchases in September 2012, we've been pointing to, we really are looking to improve the labor market outlook. Uh, we're going to continue to buy assets, and we did that for two years. Uh, $1.6 trillion of assets until we were completely comfortable that uh, the outlook uh, had improved. That outlook that had been eight point for really 8.1% unemployment and only modest improvement. After we took that action, and some other things also were very helpful, and negative factors receded, the economy's really picked up, and we've been seeing over 200,000 per month payroll jobs for quite a long time. So. That's good. I think that's going to continue. If you ask me to talk about the story that corporations have as to why they're going to continue to do that, I actually have a little more difficulty filling in all the details. You talk to individual business people, and they actually talk more about being risk averse and operations in other places that they're <laughs> nervous about. And yet, we have been seeing this growth. So I don't always understand the story in each and every firm that's going on out there. But I think, I think the small firms are doing better. Um, index today indicated uh, that they had grown jobs in small companies, so I think that's favorable. And the inflation outlook, that's the one that I think is more worrisome. But uh, in terms of economic growth, you know, I think we're back to uh, getting closer to more normal times. So uh, short-term interest rates are near zero. They have been for some time. Zero is viewed as some uh, approximate, although apparently not literal, lower bound on short-term interest rates. One of the policy responses in this situation is what is called forward guidance. I made reference to this earlier. The idea behind forward guidance, uh, at least in the economic literature that I'm, a f I'm familiar with, is that to provide a clear statement of the conditions under which interest rates will move from their, um, uh, from their zero lower bound. As a casual observer of the messaging coming out of uh, uh, the FMOC, um, the clarity has not always been evident about exactly what set of circumstances this is going to happen. Indeed, there seems instead to be a competing desire. The competing desire is on the part of the Fed is to, be, to, to buy in some wiggle room or flexibility in their decision making. So I guess my questions here are kind of twofold. One is, do concerns about clear messaging versus this flexibility show up in this FMOC discussions? And doesn't the lack of full clarity work against the basic premise of forward guidance? Yeah, so uh, we've had our policy instrument, the federal funds rate, at zero since uh, December 2008. So, um, I mean, roughly zero. We say zero to 25 basis points and uh, trades a little bit like that. But it's effectively zero. And, um, you know, as we've already talked about a little bit, the big question is when are we going to renormalize policy? When are we going to move off of that? And um, it's... You know, so the Monetary Policy Committee, we get together. It's a big committee. We've got, uh, for most of the time that I've been there, there have been 17 participants. At full strength, it's 19. There are 12 presidents who participate, talk all the time. There are seven governors. Governors all vote. We rotate the voting among the presidents. And you've got a lot of different voices. And consensus is highly valued. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, when he says I was, you know, uh, meetings were boring, when I say you kind of want them to be boring because if you want consensus among 17 different potentially disparate voices, you know, drama at the 11th hour before he's got to go into a press conference is kind of difficult and we do need to have statements and so, um, you know, so there are a lot of voices. Um, we are all pretty supportive of saying all of our policy making should be conditional, uh, depending on the economic conditions, depending on inflation. In the US, we have a dual mandate. We're supposed to provide monetary and financial conditions to support maximum employment and price stability. So we need to be paying attention to how we're getting there, what the trajectory is, and how we're supporting, or other things are inhibiting that. At zero, you know, we can't really give, I mean, we talk a lot. 
Is it because you can't move the funds rate? During normal times in the 90s, when times were more normal, the funds rate moved between three and six percent. And if you wanted to tell people a little bit about how things were going to be going in a different direction, you move the funds rate, and you might move it a few times, and then they'd get the uh, idea. If they knew what your goals were and you were oriented towards your goals, they'd understand the forward trajectory. This is what they must do if they're going to hit this. They have to. Or if you followed a rule of some sort, an interest rate rule, then that would indicate provide guidance as to longer term interest rates. So forward guidance normally comes out of how you move. But when you're at zero, you can't move it around. You talk a lot. And 17 people are going to have a hard time agreeing on six indicators by which we live and die on how to move the funds rate. Getting agreement there is very difficult. And that's why I spent an awful lot of time uh, in 2012 trying to get these two uh, measures to gain some uh, viability. And some things you would hear are like, what if the unemployment rate gets stuck? What if we, you know, what if you're wrong about the unemployment rate? And uh, we're not going to get down to 6.5%. Or we got to a different point when we blew through 65 much more quickly, and it was sort of like one option we could have taken was, well, why don't we now change that number? Why don't we say we're going to do it until it's 6 or 5.5? Now, that's changing the, you know, that, that's flexibility, too. How does that get uh, evaluated? But if you were to buy into that, a question that comes back is, what if we get stuck at 6 and a quarter? Which my viewpoint is, all of the theory we use to run policy says that inflation is going to start taking off. If I keep pushing and pushing and pushing and I can't get unemployment down, inflation is going to take off, and we're not seeing that. So I'm about as amenable to, as anybody to putting some explicit numbers down. But it, it's hard to do. And at the end of the day, the lowest common denominator often is qualitative conditionality. And we've got a lot of words that do indicate that our policies today are conditional. But you could read it and wonder about that. I think that's fair. That's why we go out. That's why we go. That's why I go out and talk like this. You know, as much as anybody will invite me and people will let me talk. Um, so this was meant, meant to be a clear statement of how we'll implement forward guidance. Absolutely. Okay. Good. <laughs> so uh, let me follow up. If you want to follow up. That's fine. <laughs> no, I still, I'm still trying to uh, digest it. But anyway, just. Uh, um, so let me put on my econometrician's hat. Um, so there's scope for the greatest divergence in opinions when historical evidence is weak. So a prominent illustration of this might be um, present in recent op-eds by two prominent economists. One by my colleague John Cochran, who wrote um, a, uh, an ed editorial on an autopsy for the Keynesians. And within a few days, another one by Paul Krugman with a rather different perspective on the Obama recovery. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, rather than have you pick you know, which, you know, which is the correct perspective or perhaps neither one, I, I, I want to turn to a little bit different point here. So statistician in me kind of makes me speculate that when the existing empirical evidence is weak, it opens a door for these kind of Cochran-Krugman style divergence of opinions. Uh, in which the data is out there to, uh, is open to multiple interpretations. And, and I kind of kind of view their exchange as an example of rather dramatic interpretations of very similar data. From, but, but the statistical perspective, and certainly its consequences on uh, uncertainty, gets lost or disguised in policy discussions and potentially diminishes, at least in my view, the quality of discourse about public policy. For instance, how potent are really Keynesian frictions in the macroeconomy? What can we really say about the success in uh, a Fed policy and its impact on labor markets? So I'm kind of curious about your views. What prevents a better acknowledgement of the evidential uncertainty within the realm of policy discussion? And, 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 and is it detrimental? Um, yeah, we could probably do two or three versions of this question. Um, so now, you've already, in your wonderfully kind introduction of me, alluded to one of my works. And I don't recall for sure that we used the term in the paper, but you referred to it as a new Keynesian model. So I guess I'm kind of, or at least by research, I have something over on that side. Never mind. Um, <laughs> what, um, I mean, here's the way that I try to tackle um, issues and questions like that. As a policymaker, as somebody who contributes to policymaking, um, we have to have opinions about you know, how the data are going to come out. 
how a wide variety of data are going to come out. It's not just a single data point, but you know how the real economy is going to behave, how inflation is going to behave, how financial markets and other things, and how they're going to interact. As economic researchers and macroeconomists, anybody who's worked on this has to understand that writing down a coherent <coughs> model, set of equations subject to some discipline, however much you are willing to entertain, that's a lot of restrictions across all of that data, and the data aren't going to like all of the things that you make it try to explain. And so what I buy into, because I've done research with uh, Cristiano and Eichenbaum, is try to document what I think robust statistical facts are and how those facts ought to be accounted for, recognizing uncertainty around those facts. I mean, you know, there are standard errors around all of them. And what's the co-movement there? We put together a model which captures some uh, of the code movements in the macro data. I think it captures a lot of them that are useful, especially for policymakers, but that's debatable. Um, and the way that I would like the contest, debate, to carry on is somebody brings their analysis to the table and they tell me, Make, they make predictions like we're willing to do. I think inflation is going to look like this over the next few years. I think it's going to be accompanied by movements in labor markets that look like this. The real economy and productivity are going to behave like that. And I will be surprised if it behaves in a different configuration. I will say, though, that in sort of looking at the, um, you know, largely the kind of uh, refutable predictions that Paul Krugman has laid out in his columns and whatnot, I think he's been right way more than he's been wrong in terms of the weakness of the recovery, in terms of the difficulties that the economy faces when fiscal policy has been uh, more restrictive, in terms of the chances of long-term interest rates going up in, in this environment are extraordinarily low. That is something that has been borne out, and he mentioned very early on. Inflation is very low as well. There were a number of famous economists who, uh, you know, wrote and uh, criticized our actions back in 2010, saying that we were going to end up with extraordinarily high inflation pressures. I did worry about that, uh, but as it turns out, according to these lines of analysis, um, wasn't likely, didn't happen. Um, so I agree that there's a, still a lot of uncertainty and nobody got it exactly right. But if people were better at laying out a track record of what their refutable predictions are, we could actually discuss this more fruitfully. So there's a real challenge in this. Let me, let me probe a little bit further on this. Um, the so-called counterfactuals, that, that, that is, we observe one particular time series evolution from things. And it's, it's, it's still open to multiple interpretations. And yes, we can say that this, um, I can design this model so it can kind of match these facts. Um, and I can, clever people can design other models that can match the same sort of facts. It seems like the type of counterfactuals we can't run, whereas Krugman will write columns that, oh, you know, uh, if, if only we'd done a much more substantial, massive fiscal stimulus, we would have come out of the recovery much, much faster. Uh, we can't run that counterfactual. Some of us would be skeptical that that would be the case. Can't do it in the data. Yeah, we, yeah, we can't read that out of the data, right. And we can't do it in the economy itself because we've only observed once. I mean, I, I, mean, it's, I, yeah. I, I would love for you, you, you guys to engage in more experimentation, and then people like me could learn a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> but this is <laughs> with certain philosophical challenges. But so I'm always nervous about clinging to one explanation of the data, which comes from the data of this and, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I'm happy so. to be disabused of the view that there's not a good competitor. And anybody who steps up and uh, sort of brings more constructive, positive predictions, if you look at the kinds of commentary that or the basis for this question and others, they tend to be more critical. It's, you know, once you lay it out, it's but easier to be critical, but. In uh, truth, I've never seen the Krugman quantitative model. You're, you're, you're talking about your empirical work and, they, and your own model. Well, and, I mean, I don't, I don't quite know who the Keynesians are. I'm trying to fill in, yeah. uh, in, in that. All I said was, I think that if you read his commentary, he's made some predictions that a whole bunch of people would have said, absolutely not, that's not gonna work. And I, you know, I think some of that has turned out to be much better. Uh, than that. I, I, will ha I will say that one thing that got me extremely interested in economics and macroeconomics from 
one of my first uh, intermediate uh, macro undergraduate courses was this idea that you could look at counterfactual, or at least yeah. here's an economy, here's something that goes wrong, and here's a policy, whether it's monetary, po fiscal, po tax policies or something that could improve it. Now, we know from teaching this that there's a lot of uh, subtleties and it's much more difficult. Yeah. And so when I got to graduate school, you know, I learned about the research program that you were in the forefront of in terms of how do you go out and estimate these models where the parameters are structural so you can actually contemplate these policy interventions. That was the whole name of the game was to be able to estimate and put together models like this so that we could do the counterfactual, which cannot be done in the data because it's not, so not a good idea. Let so me be clear that I certainly love models, and I think it's and I, uh, but but the problem is that this this goes back to a point we talked about earlier. When there's multiple models that can explain the same data, each of the different models will have different counterfactual predictions. But, is that, but but are we at that state? Do we have multiple models that can explain the data equally well? That was my starting point. If we if we find, I'd love to have a conference where we have a where we have people, and the price of entry is you bring your model, uh, and it's got to explain a certain number of features. Um, and yeah. then we know how you go about explaining it. Then we can I talk think, about yeah, sure, that. Sure, sure. I think that, that those type of discourses can be very, 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 very productive. Mm -hmm. But I also, I think many of us are not what, willing to say this is, you know, one person produces a configuration <laughs> with, with, a, with a whole bunch of bells and whistles and you magically you match time series, that that's the only way to collection of bells and whistles that will match the time series. But anyway, I think, I think we I'm should go on here. I'm confident <laughs> that the models I'm talking about will fail on a number of yeah. dimensions of and the I'm statistical completely, yeah. fitness. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so it's um, more intriguing to state things provocatively, isn't it? That's what I thought I learned from absolutely. the University of Chicago. And other Provocatively, but in a very kind of deep and substantive <laughs> way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me change the uh, course here a little bit. An, an apparent ambition of quantitative easing is to have a positive impact on labor markets. From my view, although it wasn't clear given your statement that the Fed kind of fixed the labor market problems, it's probably, this may not be your view, it's my view that it's challenging to measure this directly from the data. Um, and moreover, it seems to, I would, I would think that from economists that the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the best way to support labor markets is to provide healthy environment for the creation of new enterprises. And, 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 the, and in this way, is a way where they uh, nurture long-term growth. Under this view, making sure financing is available for, for this type of activity becomes critical and vital and important. So are these the considerations which you think about when you're influencing labor markets? And how much do these play in your thinking about, the head, about, about Fed policy? Right, so um, you know, I'm extraordinarily sympathetic to the way you laid that out, especially when we're talking about something much closer to normal times or what I often say is business as usual. If you look at uh, the way the economy was working in the 90s, in the 90s, uh, Fed policy, we moved the funds rate between 3 and 6%, depending on a bunch of things that happened during that time period. Um, we're pretty well served in an environment like that where we get out of the way of how the private sector is doing a good job at going about providing the products and services that people want in an efficient manner and creating new goods and services and innovating and the new firms are starting up and they're hiring people. I like nothing better than to sort of step back and let that engine of growth uh, roar along. It's just that in the environment where we've been stuck at the zero lower bound, the unemployment rate went up to almost 10%, and we've been there for a very long time, and we haven't been delivering on our inflation objective. We've said that we're supposed to deliver 2%, and we've been underwriting. We've been averaged 1.5% inflation annually for the last six years. Six years we've been way below 2 and in my forecast for the next three or four years, we're not going to get to 2% either. So I think there's a lot to the... Uh, diagnosis that the uh, there's been a lot of uh, debt overhang from the housing crisis and the financial crisis and households have been trying to work their way out of that. We made an awful lot of progress in that environment. I think that there's uh, less demand for firms, products, and services, and we needed to somehow help get that going and facilitate the deleveraging. We're so much further along now, and I think that's evident from the unemployment rate. I probably did say we knocked down the unemployment rate, that's a bit too loose. Uh, if the best thing that I can say is we got lucky that when we did a lot of policy, all of a sudden things improved, 
I'm happy for that. You know, I, like, I might like that statement a little bit better myself, so. <laughs> so let me turn to a little bit of a different subject here. Um, so recently I was able to uh, share the spotlight with uh, Robert Schiller, who's well known for his ability to spot bubbles anywhere. Um, <laughs> I'm never quite sure what his operational definition is of a bubble, except it's kind of like this pornography. You kind of know it when you see it. <laughs> um, on a rather different per matter, uh, uh, reason, a, a rather different reason to be looking at financial markets was articulated by Niriana Kutch-Lakota. I think the idea has been around for a long time, and others, uh, which argue that the Fed should use the forward-looking financial markets as a place to, uh, in place of things like model forecasts. Specifically, Niriana argued, policymakers often attempt to use statistical models to forecast future marginal net benefits. I argue policymakers can achieve better outcomes by basing their outlooks on risk-neutral probabilities derived from the prices of financial markets. So to me, this just opens up a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of, uh, uh, all the way from should the Fed be trying to influence financial markets, and if so, how, and if they do, how does this play into looking at the financial market data? But how much attention do you pay to financial markets in making policy recommendations? In what ways do you find uh, uh, evidence from financial markets revealing? In what ways might they be a distraction? And do concerns about bubbles in financial markets guide your thinking? Uh, once again, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> let me um, let me let me start off, and and I'm happy to have some back and forth when I don't talk about certain things. Um, you mentioned uh, Nariana Kochalakota's discussion of uh, risk neutral uh, pricing of things. This actually is really quite interesting and um, is is timely. In the, in the following sense. At the moment in the U.S., as I mentioned earlier, we've been ha experiencing inflation uh, well below 2% for quite some time. Uh, there are additional factors at work with uh, energy prices, relative price declines, which one way or another find their way into inflation indices. They're not necessarily true inflation. You would expect them to work their way through and not be uh, permanent. But that's a question, and you don't know how that will uh, work out. And as you try to put together a statistical model of inflation, does it have all of those phenomena in them? That's a difficult exercise all by itself fraught with the uncertainties that we were talking about before. So looking at the financial market data, there's a Treasury inflation protected securities out there which provide a uh, interesting measure of inflation, expect inflation expectations if you work hard enough at it, inflation compensation is what you get. So it's somebody's expectation of inflation plus the compensation they have to uh, be given in order to hold that uh, security. Now, there's some liquidity issues involved in some of this stuff, and so one thing we often l look at is the five-year, uh, the second half of that 10-year part. So it's the five-year forward inflation break-even. That, most recently, is 1.88. Now, that's sort of what the inflation rate is expected by financial markets, people who are hedging their inflation risks, except for a couple of complications. One, it's CPI inflation compensation uh, detail. We target the PCE target. and we, we use a PCE as our benchmark. There's a wedge. The, comp, the index is a little bit different. That wedge is usually somewhere between three and five tenths of a percent. PCE is lower. So if I want to take that number and get it to an inflation target for the Fed, I got to knock off three tenths you know, from that. So we're looking at like 1.6 for five years five years after that. That's, that's not success in terms of what we're supposed to be doing. Now, it gets even more interesting when you remember that it's not exactly inflation expectation. It's that plus compensation. Well, it used to be higher. And when it's higher than two, it might well be interpreted as when inflation's really high, I get beaten the heck out of, and I have to be compensated for that bad state of the world. And that's why it's way above two. Now it's below two. Well, that means people aren't worried about that state of the world. It's when inflation is low. That might be associated with a bad economic event, which is much worse than what I was worrying about before. There are two reasons, then, to be concerned from looking at that financial market data about low inflation. Inflation could be underrunning our objective and or the viewpoint that the world where we underrun that is so much worse than I normally think we really ought to do something 
to avoid that. So that's the kind of take you could get from looking at that data. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. It requires a lot of buy-in in terms of how you do that analysis, but I, I find that really fascinating. Now, there are a whole bunch of other things we look at with financial data just to get an idea that markets are working properly. Um, we kind of try to look at data to make sure that we're not mucking things up. One question that comes up at FOMC meetings uh, quite often is uh, they ask the New York desk manager, could you give me an uh, indication as to whether or not our purchases are mucking up market functioning in financial market? It's very difficult to know how to disentangle that, but it's a question you'd like to know the answer. So wait, could you elaborate on mucking up what that means exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so I know that... Um, so I know that markets ought to work very well if left to their own devices. Um, we don't always lead them to their own devices. Sometimes we get involved and we might be injecting wedges or something in like, that was unhelpful for get letting the economy go. I think that's the focus of that type of, of question generally. But uh, I mean, we look at financial market data. Um, I don't know, you probably weren't asking me if we look at stock market data or anything like that, were you? Sure, whatever data. <laughs> The question is, should you and do you? Oh, we look at everything. I mean, I mean, I mean of course you should uh, look at data. The question is how you should react to it. It's why, yeah, yeah. Of course, more data is preferred to less, I guess. But, but the question is I don't know. how you I look don't know. at How it. do you view that? Is that right? I mean, well, actually, it's costly to process data. So literally speaking, it's not true. So yeah. if it's, but that's. Yes. Um, OK, so here's one thing that, um, that does come up. And it's, it, we've, had, we've talked about this, and it's very important. We've been. Um, keeping the funds rate low for a long time. We're in a low interest rate environment, and a lot of people are nervous. Uh, I hear complaints regularly that the low interest rate environment is goosing up uh, some market returns. Maybe it's the stock market. Maybe it's allowing leverage in uh, certain types of areas, certain uh, off-balance sheet issues, all kinds of, of things. And so um, I personally think that interest rates would be low even if we didn't keep the funds rate low. That is, if we tried to raise rates, it would be a catastrophe, and then we'd be back down to where we were. Um, look at Europe. Europe has low rates, and they have different problems. Um, one thing that we do is every uh, quarter we get a big book that runs through the risks that we think we might be facing in some of these markets, looking for uh, leverage that might be oh, excess leverage, if, that, if I can say that here. Um, induced by some of our actions that we should be worried about. Um, could that lead to um, a whole host of issues that you wouldn't like me to, uh, you'd disagree with me on uh, systemic issues or things like that, very controversial. Um, you know, we're looking for whether or not there's some kind of collateral effect and how much trouble we could be creating even though we are trying to get the economy going. Unintended consequences, that's what we kind of uh, look for it. Now, one of the dangers, I think, is when I look at a lot of market data and you see all the positions that people have and you see that they've, you know, got a high price, I start to think that people could lose money. That's natural. That's what you do when you make investments, right? You, you put your money at risk when you do a good job, you're successful when you don't. It, so, I mean, we have to look for the implications of markets behaving differently on how the economy works, and um, we struggle with that, frankly. Well, let me go back to this bubble issue. So, so my own perspective of a bubble, you know, the pornography was a little bit, perhaps not the right analogy, but somehow from a time series person, you look at prices, they kind of wander their way up, and then they may come crashing down fairly quickly, and then all the ex post announced that's a bubble. So we seem to be better at it ex post than ex ante. Um, there, there were some concerns that Fed policy was propping up housing market bubbles, so to speak. And, and was um, do, 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 cons do concerns like this about kind of um, artificially propping up asset prices, is this, is this a cause for concern? Or is this something which, uh, uh, that, that the Fed ought to be involved in thinking about? Or do they think about it? Well, you mentioned explicitly the um, possibility that past Fed policies propped up um, housing prices. Um, you didn't mention who you're talking about. Should I guess I, or you can guess if you want. I, I, John, I, I, Taylor, John Taylor yeah, is a, yeah, yeah. a quick person to sort of point out that from uh, 2003 to 2006, before that time, the Fed had followed very nicely the um, I always say John Taylor rule. Um, <laughs> and things were good, and then in 2003, we did not follow 
the John Taylor rule. I say John Taylor rule because he's very, very specific about the allowable coefficients on the output gap and inflation gap. And if you change those coefficients a bit and it fits well with the data, that's not what he prefers. But at any rate, if you look at that according to his measure, um, we were slow to tighten during that time period. I think the magnitude of the worst case that he's talking about isn't very large in terms of the funds rate and how it might have worked its way into housing prices. So I would challenge the notion that if you could put that into a counterfactual, again, see, you've got to do a counterfactual here, right? You have to have some analysis that gives you an idea how much differently things would be and then have an assessment of that. But that's what we do. In 2005, Chairman Greenspan was out in public saying, you know, there's something funny going on here. We've been raising the funds rate for a year now, and the 10-year Treasury rate is not nearly as high as it has always been in the past. There is a conundrum. I think that was systematic of the fact that capital was flowing into the US. The Chinese were beginning uh, to, to invest in Treasuries. Uh, savers around the world didn't necessarily have a, a tremendous um, supply of assets that they could invest in in their home country, and they came to the US. So there are a lot of reasons why that was attractive. And long-term interest rates were low. Is that Fed policy, just because interest rates are low? I think there was something else going on. And I think that uh, Professor Taylor kind of uh, conflates some of that. So I, I don't think that the, the Fed had as much to do there. But I certainly recognize that our policies can cause challenges. Uh, I'm interested in terms of your view of the accuracy of the metrics of the data you're looking at. For example, you mentioned labor at 6.5%, yet uh, the number is calculated against those seeking, seeking employment, whereas like some four to five million people have given up and dropped out of the labor force. So one argues that perhaps it isn't 6.5, it's more like 7.5 or even 8%. So how much do you look at these other, at the challenge of metrics itself that you're looking at versus just going off the traditional kind of numbers? Right, so um, the, the Labor Department and other um, uh, folks publish different indicators of labor market activity. Um, there's the standard U3 measure of unemployment, which is the one that I was mentioning. There are others where you include, uh, you know, uh, you know, other people who may not officially be looking for work, but have not so long ago been looking for work. And there's a time series of these things, and so you you can kind of look at all of them together. And you know, traditionally they kind of move together. So the U6 version of unemployment is much higher than U3, but they often sort of move together. Um, and so there's often not a lot lost in sort of just sort of you know, talking about one uh, and hoping that the others look. But during the most recent period, that hasn't been the case. The labor force participation rate has behaved differently than uh, we normally would have expected. Well, for one thing, you know, we've seen declines in labor force. Now, my research staff started talking about how there are, you know, trend issues, demographics, and other things which are leading to a trend decline in labor force participation. Baby boomers retiring is only one small piece of that. The um, maturation of uh, uh, female labor force participation is another part. Young people aren't working as much uh, as they're going to school or doing other things as well. You put all those things together and you see a general downward trend in the labor force, um, that's something that a lot of people were surprised by, but if you knew the trends, you, you wouldn't have been surprised. We've been undershooting that. There's been a, a quicker decline in labor force participation during this time period. And that has tended to um, you know, also lead to a, a slower uh, decline in the unemployment rate uh, and labor market improvement for some time. We've, we've improved on that dimension. And uh, uh, the Fed Chair Janet Yellen was very careful in laying out a whole dashboard of labor market indicators. Some of them are the, the number of people who are working part-time for economic reasons. They'd like to have a full-time job, but they can only find a part-time job. That, that number is very high relative to its normal uh, behavior and has come down much more slowly than others. But everything seems to be improving. Former Fed Governor Pete Peterson, alum of the University of Chicago, uh, later Chairman of Blackstone, uh, started an organization in the 1990s called uh, the Concord Coalition to reduce the federal deficit. Um, and he was active with both, both parties on that process. Um, this current administration is on pace to double the, 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 the national uh, debt from 10 trillion to 20 trillion in an eight year period of time. Um, does the Fed have a responsibility to future generations to raise interest rates so that the Congress can do its job to reduce the federal budget and start the process of normalizing this 
untenable situation that needs to be corrected? Uh, you know, the Federal Reserve has a set of responsibilities that are defined in the Federal Reserve Act. Basically, it's provide financial and monetary conditions to support maximum employment and price stability. We're not responsible for fiscal policy. Um, we have to pay attention to what everything is happening, all the forces hitting the economy, and fiscal policy has been one of them, and so in order to hit our objectives, we try to do that. Now, I mean, your suggestion to increase interest rate, I don't quite follow the logic that you have in mind where an increase in interest rates would all of a sudden cause Congress to take different action. You know, go ahead. Um, if the interest rates, right now the, the federal budget this year, 11% of the budget will be spent on, on interest to pay the national debt. If, if interest rates were to go from where they are now, the tenure went from there to eight eight percent. That would that would uh, you know quadruple to forty four percent, which would be an untenable and unsustainable situation. So uh, you know I, I think yeah, it's I think not it's my job. It's not my job to create a game of chicken with people and uh, well, I mean make things like that. Plus the other thing is it would uh, you know I'm guessing that if we were to prematurely raise rates when the economy is not ready for it, then the economy would tank and uh, revenues would go down and it would be an even worse situation. So. There's a question in, in the back, although in the back. Yes. Yeah. So uh, as we all know, Milton Friedman, the greatest economist in the 20th century and half the namesake of the Becker Friedman Institute, said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And he talks so much about changes in the nominal level of the money stock and then the rate of growth of the money stock and the importance not just for inflation but for transitory changes in real output. It seems as if in the last hour, I haven't heard the money stock changes in the, in the nominal money stock uttered at all. How's it come? What happened? Um, well, I, will, I would put it differently. Um, I think I have carried the flag very well by pointing out that we're supposed to be providing the amount of inflation that we've said is our objective as a monetary authority. We ought to be uh, providing the appropriate level of accommodation to, to hit our inflation objective, and our inflation has been very low. I'd like to get that up. Now, the relationship between any monetary aggregate and inflation, unfortunately, um, is uh, few and far between these days. Um, I mean, things changed quite a long time ago with uh, financial innovation or for whatever reason, but, I mean, Milton Friedman provided advice to the Bank of Japan in the early 2000s when uh, they were underrunning, uh, you know, their inflation, and he said you ought to be expanding your balance sheet in order to get inflation up. Well, we have been expanding our balance sheet, and I don't think the answer to trying to get inflation to our objective involves going in the other direction. So, I mean, I, I think I've been carrying that flag. I understand you've been talking about monetary policy and interest rate changes and all that, and I understand what you just said. Is it no longer very important, whether it's M1, M2, M3, I think you referred to monetary ag aggregates, is it no longer very important what those levels are, what the rates of changes are? It's all about interest, rate, interest rates, and, and if so, what happened? You see my question? Um, you know, the appropriate monetary aggregate that actually is correlated with inflation and activity is not exactly the ones that we're talking about with M1, M2, or M3, it's an elusive object, I think, because money demand and velocity change too much. And all. I, I, I don't know, but uh, if you, I, I can't think of anybody who really talks about the economy or financial matters, I mean, private, private press or uh, financial institutions that put a lot of weight on those, uh, those types of phenomena because you can't find the correlation. Let's deal with some numbers. I'm just a bookkeeper. So, uh, your quantitative easing uh, put out $3.3 trillion to the right. banks. Banks turned around and put $2.6 trillion back into the Fed. So that leaves about $700 billion of the $3.3 trillion that you put out there. So one out of every $5 from quantitative easing got into the marketplace. Is that successful? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to follow those numbers. Let me just mention this is how things work. What we do is we go out and we buy somebody's securities. Right. So 
we print money digitally, right? I, I, I allow them to get an entry and they have reserves in the Federal Reserve System. Now, it doesn't go directly to banks. It can be, you know, private people who we buy the security right. from, okay? But that dollar, they're going to end up using to pay somebody, and it's going to end up in a checking account. One way or another, it ends up in the banking system. And there's nowhere else it can go. Somebody, so any individual bank can be unhappy with their level of reserves, and they might try to, you know, rid themselves of certain things. But at the end of the day, it has to end up in somebody's banking account, and so it ends up in the banking system. So I'm confident that all of the funds that we've pushed out one way or another have ended up in the banking system. Now, whether it's in a particular type of reserves, excess reserves or whatnot, I, I'm, I'd, have to, I'd have to get some more detail. Uh, yeah, with that, um, that, I think I would like to thank Charlie for bringing a very open discussion. <laughs>